O God, Most High, you meet us where we live and invite us to be a part of your purpose. All thanks and praise to you, for you hear our prayers for the church, the world, and all who live in it. Today we pray for the church and for all who work to bring others a word of compassion and grace. We pray for peace among nations and peace among all people. We pray for those suffering from war or calamities of nature. We pray for those who are oppressed and need courage to resist. We pray for those who, because of illness or hardship, are paralyzed by fear. God of majesty and glory, through Jesus Christ, you summon us into your compassion for all creation. Renew in us your call and release us from all fear, that we may testify in words and deeds to your steadfast love for all. For the sake of Jesus Christ, we pray. And together we pray the words that Christ taught us, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
Thank you, Janet. As we uh, continue this morning, we've been reading from Luke's gospel the last couple of weeks from chapter 4. Today we start at the beginning of chapter 5 as Jesus contend, uh, continues his ministry in northern, uh, the northern side of the, the uh, Sea of Galilee. So I'd like to invite you to stand as you're able as we join in this morning's uh, gospel lesson. So we hear this gospel lesson. <clears throat> Once while Jesus was standing beside the lake of Gennesaret, and the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he saw two boats there at the shore of the lake. The fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. He got into one of the boats, the one belonging to Simon, and asked him to put out a little way from the shore. Then he sat down and taught the crowds from the boat. When he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep water and let down your nets for a catch. Simon answered, Master, we have worked all night long but have caught nothing. Yet if you say so, I will let down the nets. When they had done this, they caught so many fish that their nets were beginning to break. So they signaled their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled the boat so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. For he and all who were with him were amazed at the catch of the fish that they had taken. And so also were James and John, sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. Then Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid, for now, from now on you will be catching people. When they had brought their boats ashore, they left everything and followed him. This is the word of God for the people of God. So how many of you have ever gotten what I would call the call? That is, when someone has called you and asked you to do something or to, to be a part of something, and, and you weren't immediately inclined to do it. I actually had someone after the first service say, it's a good thing I had a mask on because I was smiling pretty big. He said, because you are the one who called me. <laughs> I don't want to know anymore. But probably most of us have gotten those phone calls where we've been invited to be a part of something, and, and at first uh, we're, we're not sure that really was uh, the area for us to, uh, to, to be a part of. I can see Ramey Cooney smiling up here because... I will tell you a little story about Ramey. Um, she she called and and wanted information. We had a the the uh, children's ministry position open, and I said, "Sure, come in and talk to me, uh, and I'd be glad to give you more information." And between the time that she and I talked and she and I met, I called a couple of other people, and we met, and she didn't realize, but. We basically had a job interview and offered her a job then, so she was expecting just to pick up information, and she got a job. So I know exactly uh, what you were thinking about when we were, you're smiling there. But most of us have had those uh, circumstances in our lives where someone has called us and invited us to, to do something, and, <clears throat> and we sit there on the phone and we say, hmm, not sure about that, not sure about that. This uh, story of the calling of the disciples and its companion, that story that we read from Isaiah 6, are both reminders that, that God calls us sometimes in ways that we don't expect, maybe in times that we don't expect, to do things that we might not expect. And uh, we have to kind of decide how we're going to respond to that. One person in summarizing this passage has put it this way. It says, God's living word draws people in, it calls and pulls, and then pushes people out. So we've drawn you in today. We're going we're gonna to call and pull a little bit, and then we're going to push you out and, and see what happens. Uh, in these, both of these stories about call, uh, it is precipitated by certain circumstances. For instance, in the Isaiah story, in which Isaiah comes to the temple, uh, Isaiah is there at the temple. He's there because King Uzziah has died. King Uzziah was a good king that everybody loved and respected. 
And the king that was going to follow uh, Uzziah was a king named Jotham, who was not as well known and not as well respected. And so Isaiah came to pray for his people. And in the midst of that prayer, which then was this all-consuming vision of God's filling the temple with God's presence and the seraphim and the cherubim, all of a sudden, God calls Isaiah to do something. And Isaiah's immediate response was, Oh, woe is me, I am a man of unclean lips, and I live in a land of unclean lips. Now, Peter had a similar response when Jesus approached, and when he began to realize who Jesus was, he says, get away from me because I am a sinful person. A lot of times when I call people and ask them to do things, particularly if it's of a somewhat spiritual nature, like leading a class or a support group or things, uh, a lot of times what people will say to me, it's not infrequent, that say, I'm not sure that I'm really worthy to do that or up to do that uh, sort of thing. And you're in good company if that's your immediate response, for, because that was the response of Isaiah, was the spon- response of Peter in this circumstance. I always think of this story that there are actually, in a sense, two calls, because the first call was to Peter from Jesus to take the boat out into the water. Peter had and his compatriots had been fishing all night, and they were tired. They'd come in, they'd had an unsuccessful night fishing, and, and I can tell you what, you're a lot less tired if you have a full uh, boat of fish than you are when you, have, <coughs> you come in and you have no fish. So they've been out all night fishing, They've got nothing, and Jesus is there, and he's preaching, and the Sea of Galilee here, there is a shore near Capernaum. It, it's a, the, the actual, there's a rocky shore that's probably about 30 to 60 feet, maybe twice as big as this platform, and <clears throat> so as the crowds began to gather here, Jesus was slowly pushed into the water, and he said, Peter, push, let, me, let me go out in your boat so I can talk to the crowds. And Peter is not originally inclined to do that. And, uh, and so he, that's when he says, you know, we, we've already been out all night. I don't want to, I'm tired. I'm, how many of you uh, scooped snow this, this week? How many of you scooped more snow than you really wanted to scoop? You know, I, I did snow several times on Thursday and then morning, trying to keep ahead of it a little bit. I can tell you by Thursday night, even though I did end up scooping snow on Friday as well, I was tired. I was done. And if somebody had come and asked me to do something significant right then, my answer would have been, no, I'm tired. I'm done for today. And Peter was that way. He was tired. He was done. They had fished all night. We're ready to go to bed. We've already washed our nets. We've cleaned them. They're ready for tomorrow. Let me just get some sleep. But he said to Jesus, he says, because you asked me, I will do it. That may be the most important phrase of this story. Because you asked me, I will do it, Jesus. So he, he puts his boat out with Jesus in it. Jesus preaches to the crowd. We don't know the content of this particular sermon of Jesus. But we do know that after he was done preaching, he said to Peter, Okay, Peter, let's go out a little deeper and you throw your nets out. Let's catch some fish. And Peter says, There aren't any fish to be caught. I mean, you fish at night. Now the the fish have gone down deeper where it's cool. We're not going to catch any fish. But he did what Jesus said. And he got so many fish that couldn't get them all in the boat. And James and John, his partners, sons of Zebedee, they had to come and bring their boat. And they they, uh, hauled fish. So this uh, night of unsuccessful fishing suddenly became a lot happier morning as they came home with two boatloads of fish. And that's when Peter recognized the miraculous in this moment. And he said to Jesus, I'm unworthy. And Jesus says, don't be, don't be afraid. I will make you fishers of people. So he uses the immediate circumstances Jesus says often want to do. And he says, I will make you fishers of people. And then it's story in Luke says something that Matthew and Mark don't say at this point. He says, they left everything and they followed him. So how many of you think about the disciples having families? A few of you? How many have never thought about the disciples having families? 
The reality is these were all men that were past the marriageable age. And one of the things that we know is people tell stories in histories. Generally, you're going to remark on anything that happens that is unusual. And so if they didn't have families, it would have been unusual. And, it, you, you know, we think probably the uh, gospel writer Luke, who was a historian, would be mentioning that. As a matter of fact, in the chapter before this, in Luke chapter 4, Jesus heals Peter's mother-in-law in the little town of Capernaum. Now, if you ever go to Capernaum, it's really a wonderful site. There are, there are great ruins there, but there are two primary things there. There was a synagogue. It's not really a first-century synagogue, but underneath you can kind of go in the basement and see some of the ruins from the first-century synagogue. But there's a very modern church there uh, across from the synagogue that has a glass floor, which is unusual, and under that glass floor is the ruins of a home that that most scholars believe is the home of Peter's mother-in-law, which eventually became a house church and sort of the center of the church in this small town of Capernaum, fishing town. Now, if Peter had a mother-in-law, it means he also had what? A wife. He was married. So we know at least Peter was married. We suspect the other disciples were married. We also know in, in James and John, when they were called, one of the, what I think is the ironic moments in the New Testament, where James and John are called, <coughs> they're fishing with their, their father, Zebedee, and it says they left their nets and followed Jesus. And so you have this, this moment where they just drop their nets and they leave, and there is Zebedee left to pick up the pieces. Now, I would love to have had the opportunity to have an interview with Zebedee right then. So Zebedee, <coughs> your son's just left to follow Jesus. What are you thinking about? Yeah. <coughs> and so they had families. They had lives. They had things going on. And a lot of times when we feel uh, we get the invitation to God's call to do things like uh, serving at a soup kitchen or uh, sir, singing in the choir, teaching Sunday school, or donating to a mission, or the many other ways that we invite people to do things. Or even in our, our lives at home, when we get a call and our neighbor needs help or our, a relative, we also could make excuses at that point and say, I'm busy, I'm tired, I've got a life, and I really don't have what it takes to, to help you right now. And so when we think about this story of the calling of the disciples, we think about our own frailty in answering God's call. I like that both Peter and Isaiah first come to terms with their own inadequacy. <clears throat> the philosopher Pascal says that the knowledge of God without knowledge of our impoverishment generates arrogance. The knowledge of our impoverishment without a knowledge of God generates despair. The knowledge of Jesus Christ constitutes the center ground because there we find both God and our impoverishment. On Wednesday mornings, we're doing a study right now in my Wednesday morning studies of difficult sayings of Jesus, difficult words of Jesus. And a couple of the first uh, stories that we've been studying are actually people who have been called by God who didn't follow Jesus. For instance, there was a rich young ruler who came to Jesus, and he said, Master, what do I need to inherit eternal life? And Jesus says, you know the commandments? And he said, yes, I followed all the commandments. And Jesus says, okay, sell all you have and follow me. Now, Jesus doesn't tell everybody to do that. So we kind of deduce from that that this is a particular uh, stumbling block for this particular person. But the story ends sadly because this rich young ruler, it says, he went away sad because he had many possessions. And he clearly wasn't able to make that kind of commitment that these disciples are making in, in the story from Luke. In another of the stories we're studying on Wednesday morning, <clears throat> Jesus says, unless you love me more than your brothers and sisters, mothers and fathers, 
you can't have a part in my ministry. In other words, sort of like how James and John left their father, Peter's leaving his wife. They're all, they have families, but they are leaving their families to follow Jesus. They are making that kind of sacrifice. Now, I have to say, uh, for, for many of us, that is a difficult lesson for us to pay attention to. It's clear that there is a cost to discipleship with its claim upon the life of those who would respond to Jesus' call. Elton Trueblood, who uh, taught theology at um, uh, Earlham College in Richmond, Indiana, so he was an, an Indiana person for a number of years, he says, the renewal of the church will be in progress when it is seen as a fellowship of consciously inadequate persons who gather because they are weak and scatter to serve because their unity with one another and with Christ has made them bold. Let me say that again. The renewal of the church will be in progress when it is seen as a fellowship of consciously inadequate persons who gather because they are weak and scatter to serve because their unity with one another and with Christ has made them bold. As part of the communion liturgy, which we will share together in, in a few minutes, we say, make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in Christian ministry to the world. This is a prayer we pray every time we celebrate Holy Communion. Make us one with Christ, one with each other, one in ministry to the world. That kind of reflects True Blood's words. Luke gives us this call story here at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And there's a very similar story that John tells at the very end of Jesus' ministry in which Jesus tells them to go out and, and catch fish. So they are kind of bookend stories in a way. And in both cases, it is a reminder that call, God calls us to be in mission and ministry uh, in, in... You're bringing me some water. Thank you. To... God calls us to be in mission and ministry, uh, sometimes in places we might not imagine, in ways we might not think of. And we, in turn, are weak vessels that are bound together with one another and bound through the power of God's Spirit to be in mission. This abundant invitation to discipleship requires an obedient and a repentant heart, a persistent and fearless response, and a willingness to renounce everything to follow Jesus. This morning when David read the Isaiah 6 passage of Isaiah in the temple and all of that, that, that always has a personal resonance for me because... On the first Sunday after Christmas in 1983, I preached my first sermon at my home church. Now, the first Sunday after Christmas is always one of the lowest attendance Sundays of the year, so I think my home pastor thought I could do the least amount of damage <laughs> that Sunday. So it was my first, first sermon, and I preached on Isaiah 6, 1 through 8. Here I am, Lord send me. And I have to tell you, 39 years later, I still wrestle with knowing exactly what that means for my life. This is not something that we gave a one-time assent to and, and then we're done. God calls us into new areas of ministry uh, throughout our life. And so the question we have is this, how will we respond when we get that invitation how will we respond when God's Spirit asks us, who will I send and who will go for us? Will we say like Isaiah, here I am, send me? Or will we be like the young rich ruler who went away sad because he had many reasons that he said no? Let us pray. Almighty and holy God, you do continue to call us into Christian service. And sometimes we are invited to do things that initially are, are not terribly comfortable for us. But we know that you also call us to continually grow in our understanding of our faith, 
and continue to grow in the power and presence of your spirit in our lives. So we thank you, O oh God, and pray that you might help us to hear your voice and help us to respond, here I am, send me. Amen. This morning we are going to celebrate Holy Communion. I do want to remind you that communion in the United Methodist Church is open to all who earnestly seek Jesus Christ. You should have received little communion, uh, prepackaged communion elements when you came in today. If you didn't, please raise your hand and one of the ushers will be happy to provide those for you. Uh, we're still uh, doing the prepackaged elements uh, as a COVID uh, precaution. And so I want to invite you now to either turn to page 15 in the hymnal or follow along on the screen as we share in the prayer, uh, prayer of great thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. Let us pray. It is right and a good and joyful thing, always and everywhere, to give thanks to you, God Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn, Holy, Holy, Holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory, Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you, and blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, Jesus took bread, gave it to his disciples, broke it, and said, Take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so in remembrance of these, your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. By your Spirit, make us one with Christ, one with each other, and one in ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit and your Holy Church, all honor and glory is yours, Almighty God, now and forever. Amen. I want to invite you now to take out your little communion packet. If you uh, do the top seal, it will give you access to the wafer. And then the next seal gives you access uh, to the juice. The body of Christ broken for us. The blood of Christ shed for our redemption. Let us pray. Eternal God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go into the world in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. I'd like to invite you to stand as we sing our closing hymn, Here I Am, Lord.
let us go with this blessing. Go forth in peace, the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen.